what we got going on. Uh, I guess we can start with any updates on just like some of the instability stuff, like uh, like Doge and and that kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, Doge was, was uh, a pain in the neck, and the reason why is because if I understand correctly, and I hope I hope that I do, but um, people started blasting Doge, and the mempool like got exploded out, and it, I think it's still I think it's still pretty crazy now. Um, if I can find it, uh, here it is. Yeah, it's still massive right now. And I think it's because people are using Doge for inscriptions, kind of like how people were using for, for Bitcoin initially, and they were just, and that just kind of abuses the mempool in some in some way, shape, or form. I think that's primarily why. And then the other issue is that the the Doge daemon itself is a little bit like, kind of outdated from like the from the Bitcoin daemon, like it doesn't have like the performance improvements, and so. There are like there are some improvements made to the UTXO chain, specifically Bitcoin, and a couple other ones. Where if you want to like just look at all the items in the mempool, it's fairly fast and efficient. Whereas the older version, the one that Doge is not operating on, is not so efficient. And so like nodes had a hard time just like keeping up with the mempool. It was just causing things to kind of fall behind. We had them having to pause trading temporarily for you know for the network to recover, but. We made some changes, and, and, to, and I think there was like the master branch or the you know the, the dev branch of Doge had some some V two changes that would make it more performant, which nodes kind of like pulled that down and started to get back up to the tip again, which we're we're now we're now live again. But in this particular case, it wasn't even a problem because of us. It was really a problem because of performance issues on Doge combined with inscriptions kind of abusing the system the UTXO system in some sense. It was just kind of a funny thing. Yeah, and it also looks like the Doge people are going to be updating uh, Dogecoin Core to make it simpler for wallets and things to uh, query with, you know, giant inscription, um, you know, pools going on, on on Dogecoin. So they're actually, they're pulling in some changes to, to make it simpler for, you know, not only for ThorChain, but for other wallets and DEXs and, you know, people that need to <clears throat> be looking at block data in, in real time. So hopefully that should make things just easier for everybody. But trading's back up now, so yep. you can go trade Doge, do whatever. This is one of the funny things about doing things in a centralized way versus decentralized way. That a, a, a sex, like, you know, like a Coinbase or whatever, can deal with this problem just by brute force, right? They can just spin up, you know, a bunch of different Doge daemons and blah blah blah, and and query them all simultaneously and kind of um, what's called um, horizontal scaling in, in, in tech speak. You can just do that; it's fine. But uh, because you have the economies of scale happening in your benefit in a centralized scenario, but decentralization in general goes against the economies of scale. It's like the inverse of the economies of scale, and so it just becomes more complicated, or more difficult, or more expensive. Because instead of you know spinning another Doge daemon or whatever it is, theoretically everybody would have to spin up another Doge daemon. Each node operator has to spin up two or whatever, right? Theoretically, it's more com it's more complicated than that because of like how the mempool is replicated, blah, 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 and the gossip behind it all. But at a high level, there's things you can do to, to kind of like scale it ver uh, horizontally. But like we really can't do that. I mean, we can, but like nothing's stopping us necessarily. But like it just becomes overtly expensive because we have to spin up lots of more Doge daemons versus Coinbase has to spin up one. Right. Right. Like a sex could have ten Doge daemons, and one's scanning block one, the other one's scanning block two. You know, up to up to ten, and it's just it's just bashing that the the entire way, mm. basically. Where you have you have one daemon that's just scanning each block, so you don't have to scan each one individually, like in in sequence. Yeah, there's there's, there's ways you can kind of like thread things, meaning that you just create different yeah. channels where you can use, you know, to for horizontal kind of like or sharding, another word you can use in this context. But like it just. It just we we can't do that, and we can do it. There's nothing stopping us, but like it's, it's just not as applicable for us. And so we have to figure, figure, find more efficient methodology of, deal, of, of dealing with this, this kind of stuff than, than Coinbase does, because they can just brute force it. Whenever they reach a problem in this kind of context or this kind of way, they can just throw money at the problem and be done with it. Yep, makes sense. Cool. So that, that wraps it up for the the production issues. 
Um, next, so on the next update, I think we're getting trade assets. So I don't think we've actually, we, we've talked about it a little bit on here, but we should go into trade assets again um, and just make sure that people understand like, you know, what, what trade assets are and like how to use them and what they're going to be good for and uh, just everything about trade accounts and, and trade assets. Are, are, are we, so the assets themselves are called trade assets and then using trade assets, that's called uh, trade accounts or... Um, yeah. What's the terminology? I guess that's the terminology. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm amendable to, to a change if people have better, better ideas, better suggestions. But you have to create an account, so to speak, which is basically just having a, a Thor address. It's not really creating an account per se. It's just having a Thor address. Um, and then you can deposit, you know, Bitcoin into that, into your wallet, so to speak. But it isn't, but it isn't actually like, this. the thing is that, like trade assets are not actually, technically they're not actually tokens. They're not actually coins. It's just accounting internally within Thorchain systems. So it's like if you put a trade asset into your wallet and you go look at your wallet, there will be nothing there, right? Like it won't, it won't show up in your wallet in a, in a traditional sense. It's not really designed for, for like to be used as a general token to be you know transferred in that kind of way. Um, so you have the trade assets, which basically is just like a one to one representation of Bitcoin, ETH, and whatever. Um, well, technically, it's actually not one to one. Technically, like most of the time, it's one to one. But there are scenarios where where it can change. But like those are there just to create uh, more efficient assets for uh, primarily for arbitrage, so that arbitrage bots can arbitrage the network much more efficiently, which is good. Yeah. So so they're held by the network. So they're native assets that are held by the network, and but they're outside of the pool, right? So they're. You know, it's Bitcoin that Thorchain holds, but is not in the liquidity pool. So like, it's kind of a shift in, in the paradigm where Thorchain is starting to custody assets that are not all in all in the pool, which I guess technically it does already with, with like, you know, inbound assets and like and outbound assets that are, you know, kind of outside the pool, like accounting wise, but it's still held by the vault. But this is just like an expansion of that concept where mm -hmm. not everything that's in the vault is in uh, the pool is in the pool so it's like assets that are outside the pool and then there's a you know a would you consider it a wrapped asset like it, it's it definitely seems like you would consider this a wrapped asset i know we, you don't consider synthetics to be wrapped because uh, it is a different like accounting model but it does seem more like a uh well like a wrapped asset where it's just it's just held one to one no I mean, it's it's not a wrapped asset because um because it's not a token that you hold in your wallet, you can't just arbitrarily transfer it. It's either either you you mint it or you you burn it, one one or the other. You can't just like move it to some smart contract somewhere else or whatever it is. In addition to that, like all of those kind of that accounting is just it's just held by the protocol itself rather than you as an individual. And generally speaking, it's it's held to like a one to one ratio. But that can change and shift in the scenarios where the security of the network is less than the value of the assets in the, in the vaults, right? The value of the rune, of the, the bonded rune, is less than the value of the um, assets in the vaults. And then what the network starts to do is creates like a negative interest rate, right? So like you're, you're, you're depositing kind of like, uh, it's kind of like uh, you're depositing, uh, uh, not even tokens, but you're depositing tokens into this kind of like pool right of, of everything where everybody's holding their things and then you own a percentage of that pool you own some that amount of it kind of like kind of like being an lp so to speak but there's no swaps or income or any, any kind of happening and there's no second asset it's only just one asset things then in a scenario where there's it starts to get too much assets and not enough security the network will start kind of charging like a negative interest rate so now like the units that you have that represents you know, maybe you just let's say you have ten percent of the Bitcoin and of the trade trade assets, Bitcoin, whatever. Then you're going to start, you know, instead of ten percent, well, you're always going to have ten percent technically because the whole thing is minus. But the the number of BDC will will start to decrease at that point in a, in a negative interest rate. Now that that interest rate is like very weak uh, and purposely because it's not there to like punish people. Like if we if we get undersecured and we have too much assets. That's actually not really a problem. Like in the in in, in the short term, like nobody's gonna you know you can't if you wanted to cyber attack the network, it would take months. Like 
maybe nine months, 10 months, something maybe even greater, depending upon some scenarios. But like, it would just take an exceeding a long time to get there if you, if you even wanted to do it, even if you had the capital. So, but it, it starts to create like a, just a small negative interest, which will trigger, you know, people who are holding those assets to like exit because you don't want to, you know, lose your Bitcoin, obviously. So you start to exit and the act of exiting uh, makes the network, the value of the assets less than the value of the security level. The, the bonded room so it's not a, it's not a wrapped asset because when you when you create this you know uh this token and this kind of accounting in the network you're not guaranteed that it's one to one you're not guaranteed that you put one bitcoin in you're going to get one bitcoin out tomorrow there's a scenario where that can be you know instead of one bitcoin 0 0.9 or, or 0 0.98 or something like this and so because of that it's not really a wrapped asset does that make sense I mean, you can, if you did do that, he said, you know what, we're not going to do this thing. You can get rid of the economic security if you want to ignore the economic security if you want to. And then it becomes a wrapped asset. Sure. At that point. Right. But wouldn't, so, but is it's your actual, is it your actual balance that would be fluctuating? So, so the, the, the trade account assets, the trade assets, mm -hmm. they're custodied in a network module, right? So, you, so you don't actually hold them in your right. in your balance. Does does that balance? So, say there's a negative interest rate applied. You know, ninety nine percent of the time, it's just going to be what it is. You've you've one trade BTC mm -hmm. and you have a trade BTC. Mm -hmm. um, you say there's a negative interest rate because you know all of a sudden you know bottom bottom of the bear market, like we're at the security cap. Does your balance start to actually go down, or is it only when you make a trade that that no your, that your, your balance starts to go down at that point right and it goes down rel yeah, relative yeah. to how 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 much under secured we are if we're like barely under the under the thing then the negative interest rate is you know basically near like zero right it's not, it's, it's so insignificant that it wouldn't be and no one would care um but if it gets you know the, the value of the asset is twice the value of the room, then that would be, you know, a higher negative interest rate. Right? And be, but your balance is actually going down at that moment to create the incentive that like, hey, we've got too much assets, not enough security. Um, we're going to start taking your assets from you. In effect, we're going to swap it to rune and then we're going to add it to the security, give it to the nodes. And by doing so, the negative interest rate is actually causing the network to correct autonomously like correct the balance between the assets and the security right and by doing so the negative interest rate will also naturally on its own naturally decrease because of this you know right. selling of the assets buying of the ruin putting the ruin to the security side um there's that kind of that natural pressure that's just pushing in that direction now the price of ruin could continue to fall more than this negative interest rate sure I mean, at some point in time, the negative interest rate becomes large enough that it, that it balances out or whatever. But like, you have a constant pressure of like selling the assets into Rune and Rune putting the, the bond. So you're, it's, it is a self-correcting system in that in that sense. Got it. So you, in, in order to create a trade asset, do you have to deposit that asset, mm -hmm. or can you say you have you have BTC? Or like, say you have some other asset. Can you like swap to that trade asset? Or the only way to create a trade asset is to deposit that specific asset into no, into Thorchain. You can or like you can swap to it as well. Yep, uh, it also works. You can deposit directly, or you can swap to it, or you can withdraw it directly. Okay. So and and if you have like trade BTC, then you can also obviously just like swap to you know native ETH and just. That's just a withdrawal of your you have your trade BTC does a swap and then you just get your your ETH up. Yep, I mean technically you can you can swap a trade asset a Bitcoin trade asset to, to layer one Bitcoin, or you can just do a withdrawal. I, mean, I don't know why you would do the swap in this scenario because you would just why would you want to incur the fees of of the swap itself? It doesn't make any sense. You would just probably just do a withdrawal. I see. So it's two different mechanisms uh, redeeming the asset versus. Yep. Uh, redeeming it versus swapping it would be two two separate things. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. right. Well, I mean, you you could swap trade like a trade Bitcoin to a layer one ETH, and that might make some sense, right? Because you have to you have to pay the fees no matter what. If you're going to get to the trade ETH, you still got to pay the fees, and the fees will be 
I think the same, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, I think it's going to be the same. And so then it then just becomes the equivalent. Just, you're just saving an extra transaction at the other side of it to do a withdraw on the trade account. Got it. And the real advantage to trade assets is that um, there's less slippage, correct? Because it moves the price less than a synthetic asset would because, um, well, they, maybe you can explain why that is or if that's true. Yeah, it, it, the benefit primarily is, is that um, when, you tr when, you, when somebody does an organic trade and they, they sell $100 worth of rune into Bitcoin, an Arbot has to sell $200 worth of synthetic Bitcoin to correct the price. And that's kind of like, a, it's a counterintuitive and it doesn't make sense unless you understand the mechanics of how synths work and all that kind of stuff. But just trust me that that's the case for now just because it's just kind of hard to explain it. Um, I can do it if I had like a whiteboard. It's a lot easier to explain it with the whiteboard, but it's hard to do it verbally, you know? Um, and so it, it just requires twice the amount of capital to be able to, you know, arb that hundred dollars. You need two hundred dollars of the capital to arb that one hundred dollars. Uh, and this just kind of corrects it so that's like if you do a hundred dollar swap, a hundred dollar swap in the reverse direction will arb it back. And so when somebody's doing um, a streaming swap, like we just like for example, we just saw a, a streaming swap for like a hundred Bitcoin. It was like ninety nine point eight Bitcoin or something like this. And we just saw someone do a, a streaming swap of that. It was a large trade. But you know, it only kind of was half part. It was half successful. Like some of the swaps, the, the streaming swaps were successful. Some of them failed largely because the R bot wasn't able to R quick enough or to keep up with the demand. And you know, and then we had like a split situation where you, you got some of your Bitcoin back and some of your you got some of the WBC you were looking to get, right, or something like that. But the trade account, if that was live at this particular time, you would have twice the efficiency. And so the, the, with the same amount of capital that the art bot had, you would have been had been twice, uh, you would have gotten the, the, the swapper um, a larger percentage of his trade to be executed through the system, if not the entire thing. Probably the entire thing, I think. I think it'd be most likely it would have been the entire swap would have been successful. So it's really critical for price execution of this network, and that's where this is. The, this is what this is geared towards. It's really critical for price execution for ARBs to ARB a streaming swap. If ARBs aren't ARBing, oh, you're breaking up. Streaming swaps doesn't really work very well, right? It doesn't, really, it doesn't really give you a really good price execution, right? You need ARBs to be ARBing, and and this makes them kind of like kind of like they're twice the liquidity they have today. In a sense, right, and so it makes them twice more efficient, twice more beneficial, twice. So you're you're going to see naturally a lot more tra trades be more successful. You'll see trades executed w with a with a better uh, execution price. Like it's just going to be uh, much more effective and efficient for the protocol. And w this is one of the things we, I think we should need to focus on as a protocol is just is getting the best price execution in the field, especially as new ones, new protocols are coming out. We got Maya, you got Chainflip, you got Sarai, you've got, you know, I think Zeta Chain and Wormholes doing something or whatever it was and blah, blah, blah. Like there's more competition coming in the space finally. So it's shocking that it took this fucking long for that to happen. Um, Cause we've been in this space forever, but we're finally starting to see more people come in the space. And we, I want to make sure that we stay highly competitive, that we, we can outperform every other decks out there that does cross-chain swaps and we do it better in every regard in the speed and execution of the trade and the price execution like the liquidity of it i mean everything we can think of um, we want to make sure we can do better than everybody else in all cases in all scenarios it's the best that we can yeah so okay so i i could, I could see that it just makes arb twice as efficient that makes sense for someone that's just doing a, a trade, so let, let's say, you know, there's, you know, spot traders who want to trade, um, you know, pe people that may, might trade using since today just because there's no native settlement fee. Um, does that mean that there's essentially, so there's, there is, does that mean there's less fees for, for trading with a, with a trade asset? So let's say, the, you know, the equivalent the, the equivalent trade like ETH to BDC, ETH to BDC, uh, native and with trade assets, is the slippage the same? Is there less slippage? Obviously, there's no native, you know, uh, 
the L1 gas fee, which is which is great. But is is um, the slippage incurred the same, or is there less slippage no, the, for a the slippage a would, would be the same as a synthetic today? I think. Got it. I so that, that's also the, that would, that's also identical to the yeah. Right, slippage slip would be the right. same. So. I mean, I, I, I can't. We, at some point in time, we had some like virtual pool depths happening around synthetics to kind of incentivize ARBs to use it over layer one assets. And I think we actually removed that and we just put a higher like TSS signing fee, like it was like a, a dollar or something like this. So I don't think we actually do that anymore. So it would, it would perform in terms of slippage, it would be the, in terms of fees paid in the trade or swap would be the same as pretty much anything else, you know? Got it. So it, it, everything else being equal in user experience to a synthetic today. So people can essentially just move to, yeah. move to trade assets and uh, then they just have the advantages of using trade assets. Or, so what, for, the, for a person in that scenario, what's the advantage of using the, the, the trade asset over a synthetic? Uh, I mean, there's a couple. Um, the first thing is it's, it's geared primarily, at least at, at, on the initial, like, um, goal is to gear towards ARBs. That's the first kind of first and foremost. So ARBs can ARB the pool much more fas- effectively. Uh, and and ARBs would switch over because they would, they would just need to use less cap, have less capital locked up to ARB any particular trade. Yeah, I mean, or, what, what's the incentive for them to switch? I, over? Most like what's going to happen is 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 um, we'll probably disable the ability to use since for ARBing purposes. Like it's, we'll we'll force the community community over just be, it's, I don't I don't think it's any it benefit. I'm not sure what the benefit to be honest with you to to ARB is, um, but we it's, it, the benefits to the protocol, and so it makes more sense to the protocol for the, So we'll probably just like force ARBs over to it, and then, and no no ARB has come to me or or anybody so that I know of and voiced any concern about that about this trade account idea. It's just to them it's the same. Like it doesn't really make it that much, but to my knowledge at least. Um, so we'll probably just disable the ability just to, to arbitrarily just mint since, right? Which will cause ARBs to, to, to leave since and then just start using this system. You can use it if you want to. If you're like a trader trader, right? And you're just like, you like the day trade or, the, or, or you know, high frequency trading if you wanted to get into that. You can use this particular, you know, thing for, the, for that purpose. Um, and then the third purpose, I think, which is my kind of, uh, my hope, my goal is to get to limit orders and order books, and that this this would be the asset that people would probably use. Yeah, true. It's um, I mean, I feel like I had one more question about trade accounts. Um, but either way, it, this this kind of paves the way for order books and limit orders because that that that's all going to be built on top of right. of trade accounts, right? right? Yeah. I'm super excited for, for order books. I, it's, it's actually like, it's better to use this for order books than it is for synths. And the reason why that is because when you acquire a synth, you have to swap to it. So you have to pay a fee to get the synth, right? And then you have to pay a fee to exit the synth, right? And so if you are a high frequency trader or you're like, you know, winter mute or like, you know, a Cumberland or whatever the hell it is, paying a fee every time you enter and exit like that is, you know, it's, you can get expensive because you're doing a lot of trading. But with trade accounts, when you when you deposit and when you withdraw, there's no fee associated other than the layer one, you know, gas fees, you know, and that kind of stuff, right? So you don't have to pay a fee to, to enter to the kind of to acquire a trade asset or to withdraw a, um, a trade asset other than the gas fees, right? Of of like Bitcoin or whatnot. So it's it's cheaper uh, for people. It's more it's more usable for institutions. To use this versus versus a synthetic, so it's better better for for books um, to use this particular kind of asset, which is nice. It's really nice. It ends up just kind of being the same kind of experience as like what you do with Coinbase or Binance. Like when you trade on Coinbase or Binance, you don't do a swap. That's not, I mean, not really. You never re- you never swap with Coinbase or Binance. What you do is you sign in. You know, you get a deposit address. You deposit some Bitcoin or whatever it is. And then they accredit your account like six hours later, whatever the hell the fucking time frame is for it, you know. And then you have this like, you know, Bitcoin in your wallet that's effectively an IOU, right? Which is what a, tr- a trade account is. It's kind of like an IOU, similar to it, but a little bit different. Um, 
And then you just start doing your trading, you know, like you open a limit order to do this and, uh, and to buy this and sell this and then buy that and sell that and do this, that, blah, 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 whatever it is you do. And then at the end of it all, you, you're left with a bunch of, you know, Bitcoin or ETH in your wallet and your kind of like account, your Binance account, and then you withdraw it, right, to ETH, right? Like you just exit the ETH to your, you know, OF address. And so conceptually, like limit orders on ThorChain becomes the same kind of experience, the same kind of UX as what you do if you're, you know, a pro trader on Binance or Coinbase or Kraken or OKX or whatever it is. And now you can have people build, like you trust a Thor, Thor swap or somebody else to build entire UIs that are not geared towards swappers. It's geared towards traders. It's geared towards people who are used to using centralized exchanges and they're, you know, for, to do all their trading and whatnot. And you just give them basically almost an identical experience with lower fees right i think that's that's going to be that can introduce a lot of people and expand our community and expand our market expand our use cases expand the, the type of people that we attract quite significantly theoretically yeah especially with no slippage going in and out of a trade asset because like you see this all the day all, all day in the thorchain dev discord in the alerts channel i see like you know tons of uh, tons of people that are streaming there right now it's a streaming swap that they have to do to go from bitcoin to synthetic bitcoin so that, that's five basis points of slippage basically right off the top that you're gonna have to make back through arming uh but it, it, it makes a lot of sense that arbs would switch over like that that is exactly what i was looking for when i was asking like what's the incentive to to switch over it's like you don't have to pay to get into the system you can just deposit yep. and you have a have a trade asset that's that's in there yep that's also true also true i should have mentioned that earlier but yeah yeah that seems like they're really big um boom there and one more question about this uh is people that have their request to come up we can we can get to some questions about sure. about order books slash trade assets but so okay so let's say you have uh trade btc and you want to swap to to trade eth or trade usdc mm -hmm. Uh, where, where does the asset come from on the other end? So like, it's just extra assets that are in the pool. Like how, how are those trade assets being added on the other end? If not for like pool rebalancing, oh, yeah, like, yeah. where does the trade asset come from that you're swapping? So to? think of this way, like think about in, put in your mind, like kind of four pockets, right? The first pocket is just like Bitcoin outside the pool. And then the second pocket is just like the Bitcoin pool itself, which has Bitcoin and, and, and Rune in it. The third pocket is the ETH pool, which has a ETH and Rune in it. And the fourth pocket is just ETH outside of the pool, the trade asset. And so what you're doing when you trade, when you go from a trade asset to trade asset is you're, you're taking the, the, the first pocket, you're taking the, the trade Bitcoin, you're moving it from outside of the pool to be inside of the pool, right? Which adds Bitcoin to the pool and then takes out Rune. Rune gets then added to the ETH pool, which then takes out ETH from the ETH pool, and then the ETH just gets moved to uh, the ETH outside of the pool, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's, gotcha. So it's just, it's just an accounting It's, it's just accounting. It's, like, it's not even a, Nothing's yeah, moving right, right. fucking anywhere, really. Like, everything is... It's just like, oh, the number of Bitcoin in the pool is increased and the number of rune in the uh, bitcoin pool is decreased and the amount of rune is increased in the in the pool and of eth and the amount of eth in the pool is decreased i mean that's but the number of eth and bitcoin blah blah, blah and rune like on, on the network in the vaults whatever is unchanged right it's just an accounting thing uh let's get to some of the people who came up here uh Paulie, what's up, man? Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Um, I'm not sure who, who I'm speaking to on the Thor account, and it's, it's all good either way, but Chad, I'm Paulie. Uh, I don't think we've ever uh, interacted before. Um, How are you but, doing? Yeah, I'm great, man. Thanks. Happy Friday to you guys, if it's Friday where you are. Um, I just saw that this space was open, and I figured that I would just jump in, and you know, I noticed that when I came into the room, there was like around 70 people, and now we're already coming up on 1,000 people, so that's awesome, and I'm glad that there's a large audience here, so I figured maybe, um, is it okay with you guys if I ask a couple questions and, and um, share a couple things? Well, first of all, 1,000 people, holy shit, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> I, nine, did, there's I didn't nine, know that. 
Yeah, I bring a I large didn't... audience. I bring a large audience. So there, <laughs> I didn't there's, know that one. There's 911 people listening live now, um, which wow. is great. Which is great. That's right? great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, ask your question. Yeah. So I just for context, like um, I'm the founder of a project called Palm Zero X, right? And right now we're using uh, the Uniswap infrastructure on the back end to route uh, all of our transaction volume. And uh, the DEX is about 161 days old, and we've just surpassed uh, half a billion dollars in volume. And the reason that this is relevant to Thor is I'm not just trying to talk about like myself and what I do, but we've been in contact with uh, with some of the, the team members at Thor, and we're very interested in migrating over to the Thor uh, infrastructure, right? And so, the, you know, that being said, I'm curious if you could just, like, kind of share for at least, like, you know, the 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 900 or so people that I brought in here, um, maybe if you could just kind of give, like, a general introduction to, like, what Thor is and why it's, like, superior in many ways. And, I, you know, for, for, for starters, like, I know that it's chain agnostic. You can trade native Bitcoin on Thor chain. You can also trade, you know, other networks that are not EVM machines, right? Um, that's my understanding. So maybe that's kind of what I would request as, like, a, a, a thing since there's such a large group of new new people here, right? So you, you built a new DEX and you, and you want to utilize uh, ThorChain within the context of this new DEX? That you oh, I, that, th- to be honest, like that's something that like we don't even need to discuss in here because we already have like the the contacts uh, with with some team. Like Gavin is who we've been working with on that, and we already have yep. the engineers connected and the repositories and everything. But Tyler Reynolds is a good friend of mine, and he's the person that introduced me to Thor. And yep. um, so shout out Tyler, amazing person and super intelligent. I think he's great. But yeah, I guess. I think it would be interesting for myself and for the audience, maybe if you could just give us like very basic introduction to what ThorChain is and, and what's good about it, if, if that works for you guys. Sure. Um, Kyle, do you want me to do it or do you want to take the honors? All right. Well, I'll, I'll start it off and you can, you can pick up wherever I leave off. So ThorChain is just native asset infrastructure. You can think of it as a centralized exchange, just running on decentralized infrastructure. So it's just it's a framework to custody bitcoin and any other asset in a in a vault that's sharded into many different keys and then all you need to do is just deposit assets into the vault and uh it can swap cross chain so you can do anything you could do on a centralized exchange just with uh on on these decentralized rails so you can trade native bitcoin to ether to stable coins and uh yeah thorchain powers the Cross chain rails for uh, you know a ton of different projects in this space like like Shapeshift, uh, Trust Wallet. We do the uh, uh, the cross chain swaps for for them and a bunch of a bunch of other guys in this space that use our liquidity. And uh, yeah, it's the, it's the biggest cross chain infrastructure project that's out there. Just answering the question like how do you custody native Bitcoin in a vault that's run by you know, anonymous anonymous individuals and have that be economically secure. So the entire ThorChain framework is just built around that question and, and securing uh, assets in a sharded vault, essentially. I have a question, Kyle, if it's okay. Um, and and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being educated myself. Like I'm not like pretending to not know this stuff. A lot of this stuff is very new to me as well, but my engineers are super familiar with Thor and, you know, they're the ones who are like the most geeked out about like the, the concept of transitioning over, because I think that compared to Uniswap, it would first of all, offer the ability to trade with the native Bitcoin, which is to me a, a massive value add. Right. But, of but in addition to that, the chain agnostic factor is powerful to me and compelling, but also I believe that you guys are able to achieve better market rates than anyone else right now and and then you have the streaming swaps which allow people to conduct large uh large size like basically whale volume transactions without getting impacted with like a massive amount of price impact or slippage right is are those things anything you could add some color to yeah it's, it's something we we kind of innovated was this idea of what we call a stream swap and it just allows uh, basically, it automatically just cuts a large trade into like a bunch of small ones, so you get the best price execution possible. And with that, like you can get something as low as five basis points. Like oftentimes, people make trades and they they get better better execution than you can get on Coinbase, Binance, Uniswap, even Curve for coin, you know stable to stables. Like it's pretty it's pretty awesome, you know, to think that we we're now DEXs are now surpassing uh, centralized exchanges is, is unreal. Yeah, I mean it's it's funny that CZ predicted that himself. He was like, I believe that that uh, 
you know, DeFi is going to be sort of eclipsed by, uh, by CeFi is going to be eclipsed by DeFi, right? I think he said that at the be- like at the end of 2023, maybe, which I, I thought that was an interesting little tidbit to catch from him, right? Well, it makes logical sense because a centralized exchange like Coinbase or whatever, right? Taking them, for example, they have to um, have a huge company with hundreds and hundreds of employees, right? They have like a couple hundred security engineers alone. No, not even devs, but just like people dedicated towards security. They have to deal with the government. They have to deal with all these things. They have to have uh, cost of operations and this kind of stuff. But but a DEX can just, you know, be built and in, in, in just deployed by a handful of devs. Like, you know, initially like Thorkin was built in, in just by three people, right? Over the course of like two or three years. And you can just build this thing, and, and it doesn't have to have this kind of huge infrastructure behind it that requires huge, like hundreds of millions of fucking dollars to operate. So it, it has an ability to, to undersell everybody else, in a sense, just because it's so cheap to interact with it, and so cheap to build, and so cheap to operate it. Kind of similar to like how like AI is like really cheap. It can do lots of things with AI like really fast and really cheap. It's, it's a little bit like that. So it, it's inevitable that that like DEXs in general or DeFi in general will kind of eclipse uh, centralized systems. And the only way that cannot be the case, at least in my opinion, is that if, if, is if institutions themselves are prohibited or nervous to interact with DeFi protocols because they're just nervous what Gary Gensler is going to say about it, right? If we get, if we get uh, clarity from, you know, the Congress and whatnot that, you know, that it's okay to swap with a AMM protocol. It doesn't matter where the liquidity comes from, but you can just go ahead and swap with it. Which I think that's going to happen at some point because, because I think it's in the best interest of, of of markets. That would be like that would be the the last nail in the coffin, and then then everything would be done through DeFi. It wouldn't make any sense except for the U.S. dollar um, to interact with DeFi at all. Um, just to just to clarify, I believe Gavin is is one of the fa- the three founders that you mentioned, right? Um, no. no. So Gavin, Gavin's the uh, CEO of Nine Realms. Who's one of, we? So I'm, I'm part of the Nine Realms team. Uh, familiar Cal here from the Nine Realms uh-huh. team. Uh, so we do uh, we do infrastructure, security, core dev work for Thorchain. So Gavin's just a huge Thorchad and someone that's been building in the space for for a long time. Like founding engineer at at uh, BitGo, and uh, you know big big resume in the space, and just like and we're we're all just just Chads that are passionate about. Uh, cross-chain exchange and just being like being, being the future of decentralized liquidity because we i mean we really do believe that everything is going to be moving to decentralized rails you know sometime in, in the next 10 years it, it just makes logical sense just because of the you know increased capital efficiency and just the, the like you know that exchanges are going to have to rebalance their liquidity somewhere there needs to be a base layer for liquidity where exchanges can go well we need more bitcoin uh you know, we, where, where are they going to get it? There's no native way to, to do that. You need to go OTC. It, it would make infinitely more sense for there to be, you know, this base layer of liquidity where they can really tap into. So we're just, you know, that, that's our group. And, you know, Gavin's on uh, with us. And awesome. Just, you know, really believes awesome. in the future of this space. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't even have full clarity about what it was, but I knew he was close to the project. And I think Tyler uh, introduced us, which was amazing of him. Um, it's funny, like, for, for some context... One of the additional, like, I, I think that Uniswap is, like, a, a reasonably good experience, right? Just in terms of, like, being a user and, and being able to use the product, right? But it's funny because I don't know if you guys know Hayden or whatever, but he has me blocked, and he has also blocked the DEX, Pawn Zero X, uh, even though, we're, you know, we're, we're pushing half a billion dollars in volume through his exchange. So I thought that that was a very strange, strange gesture to, to block the, <laughs> the person responsible for bringing him half a billion dollars in volume like in my mind i thought maybe that would be something that you would want as like a protocol founder right i don't know yeah i mean he bought Thorchain like three years ago and saying it wouldn't work and that was a scam before it was <laughs> before it before it existed so i mean that, that's that's what happened uh, over here he still he still has Thorchain blocked yeah. so yeah i mean before it came out he was like this you know this won't yeah. work this isn't, this isn't i guess possible. he has a pattern then, of being you know, three years running a pattern of butthurtness but anyways I, I speak kind of crudely so i won't project that onto you guys but the last question that i have is Right now, we're dealing with this network congestion on ETH, right? The Ethereum network 
work has been very congested, and I speculate that a lot of that has to do with this this sort of silly scammer cabal promoting this nonsense ERC four hundred four, which is like this totally broken and exploitable uh, fake token standard that's not vetted by the Ethereum Foundation or anything like that. But neither here nor there, the the network is congested, right? Regardless of the reason why. And I'm curious, like when the when the Ethereum network is congested or when the Bitcoin network is congested, is there anything about Thorchain um, that is like able to sort of insulate itself from the affected congestion or does the congestion directly impact uh, your guys network in, in a similar way um no it, we, it does have some kind of impact I mean, we, we are kind of we have to deal with bitcoin layer one because that's what we do right and so any, anything that's happening there inherently has to happen to us but the one the one exception though i think would say as we were talking earlier about um about uh, trade accounts is that like you can you can trade on Thorchain with your Bitcoin whatever and, and, and you know and exit to layer one Bitcoin if you want to and you can ex- and you can kind of skip all the gas fees you know uh, associated with Bitcoin or ETH or whatever and once once trade accounts is live and you actually can do it today with synthetics if you really wanted to go you know have at it but uh, trade accounts will be even even better for the for the for the protocol and for the community but yeah so you, you can you can kind of skip all that and just trade directly that way if you want to. For sure. And and I guess like just my understanding is that Thor right now, you guys kind of have the, the ability to offer the best rates um, on the entire decentralized market. Would you guys agree with that? Generally speaking, I haven't seen anybody beat us yet, to be honest. So, yeah. yeah. So, so that's 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 like. That's a big part of my motivation to want to migrate over to the Thorchain Rails is because the the vision of like what we're doing is just all about delivering the maximum value to all the users, right? And to right. reward them for participating in, in everything as much as possible. But you know, if we can if we can deliver people a, a trading experience where it's it's just as good, if not better, in terms of speed and, and ease of use than Uniswap, but also more competitive and better market rates, like to me that's a home run. So right. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm just excited to continue progressing down that road we're working on many different things at once so sometimes the bandwidth can be a little uh directed in 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 one way where you know it might take some time to to finalize the implementation of that but i have a feeling that um we'll be in touch more and um, yeah i just i want to thank you guys for sharing the stage with me with now there's almost 1500 people listening now so i'm going to (laughs) step out of the way here and let you guys do what you want to do but um you, this is me on social media, and uh, maybe we can chat on the side sometime. And yeah, sure. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, feel free, to, feel free to DM me if you want to. But I, I agree that like I think being decentralized is great, but it's not it's not the only attribute, right? Being also having Bex X is also you know important to, to get adoption and, and pulling away from centralized exchanges and that kind of thing. And that's have, having what you said. Yeah, having best X, best, best price execution, right? Having oh yeah, yeah, best execution, the best, the best sure. on the best on fees, basically, right? That's like it's great to be decentralized. That's obviously a, a big goal, and that's one of the things, we, the things that we started off with predominantly, just making sure we were properly decentralized, like fully. Um, but we can't stop there. We have to we have to beat on beat every centralized exchange, especially on every attribute that we could possibly muster, with the exception of like dollars. We can't fuck around with dollars for obvious reasons. But except for that one thing, we want to beat them in every regard. Amazing. Well, yeah, I think that um, the the future looks bright, and um, you know, I think it's just about who can deliver the best for for the people that are using this stuff. And of course, like one one thing that I know I kind of have as a strength, and it's funny, like you know, that we were able to bring so many more listeners here is I'm able to bring an audience. And sometimes, sometimes like the best engineers in the world can deliver the execution and and all the tech, but sometimes we have to combine forces and make sure we bring the audience right and the users too. So I don't know. I'm hoping that I can contribute to what you guys are doing, and uh, I hope vice versa as well so thanks for having me and um, you guys have a great weekend I added you as a friend on here Chad so we'll be in touch great I'll follow you as well thanks guys take care cool man um yeah, that was dope. <laughs> thanks for coming up, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we are actually we are going to be at Denver. We're gonna we're gonna throw a uh, a little happy hour on most likely March second. So if anyone's coming out to East Denver, uh, you know, Thorchain community is definitely going to be there. Chad's going to be there. Uh, we're we're gonna make a presence out there. So uh, yeah, looking forward to, to meeting some people and you know talking about cross chain liquidity. Uh, we're we're huge Bitcoiners, so we love talking about you know everything related to to Bitcoin, to DeFi, uh, Ethereum. You know. That's that's us. So, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, who's next? Uh, John, John, what's up? Hey, 
Yo, John, you there? Do not hear you. Nope. He's there, but he's not able to speak, I guess. His mic is broken. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll, we'll come back with him later. Next. All right. Let's, let's clear it. Let's, let's clear up the stairs. This is something going on here. <laughs> Uh, Crypto Italia, what's going on? Oh, wait. Sorry. Let me bite him back. Oh, did you kick everybody off the stage? Let's just add, add people back here. There we go. John, you there? Yeah, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Yep, that's cool, cool. Uh, so I got exposure to ThorChain basically through Pond, uh, and I'm just checking out your guys' website, and I see Savers faults, and I'm just curious on what's the kind of an explanation between the Rune BTC APR, for example, and the difference between the Savers APR. Like, kind of just a brief explanation on kind of what I'm looking at here. Yeah, so essentially there's two different ways to provide liquidity on ThorChain, and that's either dual-sided or single-sided. And uh, so like any other AMM, you can provide dual liquidity. So it's, it's paired with Rune. So you pair your native BTC with, uh, with native Rune, and that goes in the pool. And a dual, dual LPs receive basically twice the yield of a, of a regular LP. Uh, sorry, of a single-sided LP. And, uh, but they also receive the impermanent loss of the single-sided uh, savers, uh, the, the people that only provide BTC, essentially. So the people who provide just BTC, it's also providing liquidity, but um, you receive less of the uh, less of the liquidity fees, but you're um, you're essentially principal protected. So it's just it's two different risk profiles for two different types of, of LPs. One that's more levered towards you know rune exposure, and then one that's just single sided uh, BTC. So they're they're two two ways to provide liquidity that have kind of a different risk profile and uh, just like different mechanics behind them. Cool. Thanks. Yep. No worries. Alexander. Thanks. Hey guys. Thanks for having me. So I try Tor swap over the, the app, right? App Tor swap that finance and I use Earn. And I actually have four positions and one with your notices, you say, okay, BNB on the beacon chain is, is uh, shutting down or sunset. So I actually wanted to withdraw my put there in urn. And whenever I do this, I go to withdraw, then I have this nice slider, but the withdraw button actually never gets active. So I tried to get some help over Discord. They say it sent first 0 0.001 BNB to this address with this memo, and then it should work and stuff. But uh, until now, uh, the button is not active. And I use uh, a key store right, to connect to your sure, site. Sure, sure. So we, we can't really do technical support in a Twitter spaces because I don't think it's really inter entertaining or interesting for the, the rest of the community who are here listening to us. Um, sorry, my, my thing just stopped working all of a sudden. No, 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 you're good. Uh, uh, yeah, so you should you should go back into that Discord ticket and, and talk with them because uh, so this is for, for just general like you know Thorchain things. You should you should talk with the interface that you're using. You can use ThorSwap and talk in their ticket. There's also other interfaces like Shapeshift or AsgardX. You could load the same wallet into and just to go to withdraw. So okay, uh, thanks. But but Discord is the right communication channel then. For, for, yeah, okay. yeah. Thor, Thor swap Discord. Open up a ticket in there. Don't answer DMs or anything like that. <laughs> there it is. I always, always scammers in the DMs. Watch out yeah, for that. Thank you. Yep. No worries. Uh, uh, talk about order books some more. Um, sure. Yeah. So okay. So order books built on top of trade assets, and that's not the next feature that's coming. Like I think we're going to see Memolus, um most likely in between. Uh, trade assets and, and order books. So, um, you know, it probably coming sometime in the next like couple of months, but just mechanics wise for order books. Um, so how exactly is, is order books going to function? So you, you need a, a trade asset to start it and like, or like what's, what's the user flow of someone, you know, placing a limit order on Thorchain? Like what, what parameters do they need to, um, to, to put in to actually get a limit order started? Yeah, I mean, it's not too dissimilar from what you do today if you're doing a limit order anywhere else. You just you, you make a deposit of some asset, like let's call it Bitcoin, for example, 
and then you you know open an order, a limited order for ETH, and you you have one Bitcoin, what is your kind of your source asset, and then your destination is ETH, and you want you know thirty five ETH. I'm, I'm making up a random number, but like whatever the hell the number would be. Um, you want some quantity of ETH, and then your the the order just kind of is put on the network, and it just kind of waits until that thing can be executed. Once executed, it gets you that your thirty five ETH. Got it. So you, so you don't. Have, it's not versus USDC or, or anything else. It's really just uh, like you're, you're putting in what asset you want out on the other end, no matter what it is. So you, it, right. you could put in a, you could put in BTC and say like, I want USDC out once once yep. this price limit is hit, or you could say put BTC in. I want ETH out once this once this is hit, or any combination right. in right. between. Yeah, I think Crips will probably be USD based. Um, if we ever get down that far or do, or do perpetuals, but, but the limit orders, it's just, it's just, it shouldn't be very, it should be very uh, comfortable and familiar for people. Yeah, man, that, that's going to be so cool. And we, we talked about this a couple of times, but just limit orders, uh, making arbitrage even more efficient. Um, yeah. I, I'm really looking forward to the day once all our moves to order books. And essentially what I, what I think this is going to do, at least my theory on this is that, um, ARBs will start looking and aggregating all of the other limit orders on every centralized exchange that they're, that they're connected to as like an ARB bot, right? So essentially what DoorChain becomes is like the aggregator of all limit orders and all liquidity in the space because, is, you know, let's say that the price is, you know, there's one price on Binance, there's one price, price on Kraken, there's another one on Coinbase and every other centralized exchange. Uh, you could just put limit orders down on, on DoorChain using trade assets and essentially, once the once the Thorchain price is uh, is moved to a price where you know that you can make a profit on any of those exchanges, your order is just executed, and then you can then your bot just takes care of the ARB. And right. uh, so, essentially, it becomes the the ultimate price aggregator. That's a, a proactive price aggregator that right. would would essentially um, just put in all the all of the liquidity from all the other exchanges pretty effortlessly because right now all ARB is reactive to the price changes. Like when the price right. changes and there's an ARB opportunity, then the right. ARBs come in. But this way, uh, ARBs can just put their limit orders in before there's ever, ever any price change. So you're always getting best X on, uh, on Thorchain, no matter right. what. Yeah, it's, it's much more, more efficient in, in a lot of ways. It's, it's like there's, there's really what will, will be three different forms of ARBing on the network. And this new one was like kind of be the most efficient system so even within a streaming swap now if you're making a streaming swap you, you make a swap and then maybe you know five blocks blocks later it makes another trade and a sub trade and a sub trade like every five blocks wherever it is and you're kind of making an assumption that obs are, are being in between those five blocks which maybe that's true maybe that's not true right either way you're, you're fine the network takes care of you but like but in this case there's no kind of like trying every five blocks whatever it just it does it whenever the opportunity is there so it, it so if the it maximizes your trade against the ARBs as efficiently as possible, um, which is really kind of really bullish for the for the project in many ways, actually. Like, right now, like if you do, an, let me give you an example. If you do an ARB, an ARB swap, right, and let's just say it takes an, uh, a, a sorry a regular swap through streaming swaps, rather, it takes like a full day to do a trade. Like every sub trade, every you know. Every five blocks, blah, 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 and it takes, you know, it does 300 swaps, sub swaps, blah, 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 and it takes about a day, whatever the hell the number is. Well, instead of doing that, it would just, it would just execute the trade as fast as the ARBs have capital for it. Like it's the stronger the ARBs, the faster that whole thing would execute. So it would be just as, it could be literally like the utmost that the ARB system, the ARBs are willing to provide capital for. It would just be like as, as instantaneous as possible relative to what ARBs can do rather than just like oh well just like we'll split over like a course of a day and you know blah, blah blah for like a super large trade and this just becomes like so fast so efficient and ARBs can cycle their capital through the network much faster so the number of times like if you've got like let's say you got two million dollars in ARB and you're just like constantly ARBing kind of going around in circles so to speak to close the loops you can then do that like you know instead of doing it 30 times a day you can do it 50 times a day or some other number. So you actually make the ARBs themselves also more efficient, effective and efficient inherently so. So it's just like, it's so more bullish for the, for the project and so bullish for um, the trade volume of the network. 
So, uh, okay. Qu- question for you, because this is something that we talked about with trade accounts being twice sufficient as synthetic assets for, for trade volume. Do you expect trade volume to decrease once we switch over to, uh, to trade accounts rather than to synthetic assets? Because if, if ARB is essentially twice as capital efficient, then that means that there would be, like naturally there'd be twice as, half as much ARB as there is today, like given the same amount of organic trading activity on all the different front ends. So, do, so is the expectation that volume is likely to, to decrease with the same, uh, yeah, same activity? I, I would expect to see our like total swap bond to decrease in the short term, but um, because of the efficiency that it gains to the pro- like to the protocol in general, I would expect in the middle or long term to be more. Do you mean by that? Okay, wait, can you can you explain that concept again? I, I think we we went over that before, but like why? Yeah, why exactly would you expect it to, to increase over the long term? If if the especially if the liquidity fees that. Um, it would be generating would only be half because there's half the volume, if, if that's correct. Well, yeah, because because the ARBs are going to be twice more uh, more efficient and more effective, which means the total amount of capital that the network can trade in a given amount of time would be increased and so ex- execute at a competitive rate. So because you're making the network, you know, more more capital efficient, you can do a higher volume of trading, which will, you know, generally speaking, would it would advocate for that or, or incur that just because... Like when, when you have a high TVL, when you have a deep pool, right, you're more likely to get more trades because you're more capital efficient, right? The amount of slip that you would experience in a deep pool versus a shallow pool is a lot less. And so people are more likely to trade in deep pools than they are in shallow pools just in general, right? So by being more capital efficient, you kind of invite more capital in, in a matter of speaking. It won't be instantaneous. It won't be like, oh, we flip the feature on, and then like day two, it's like, all, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's why I say like a medium, maybe long term. It takes time for the market to react to, to the conditions of the market. So it'll, it'll take some time, but, but I think initially we'll see a, a decrease in overall trade volume because ARBs are being much more efficient. And then over the long term, we'll just invite more capital. Yeah, man. Order book's going to be awesome. So the, the general order that things are going to be shipped or trade accounts will be in the next release. So, uh, you know, probably in the next like two weeks or so, we'll trade, trade assets will be available. Um, and then after that, I think the next major feature that's planned is memo list transactions. And then after that would be would be order books. As, as far as I'm aware, that's the general order that, that things would be shipped. So, um, yeah, probably, probably looking at like, you know, uh, like, a month or two at least for for order books and you know probably more time than that just because just you know testing and validating all the new features that are coming on is going to take some time especially like you know brand new primitives like trade assets and memo lists but it's all all being worked on uh you know synchronously and uh you know all, all shipped all queued up to come out uh you know in subsequent releases so those are all the, those are all the near term priorities yeah, I, I think uh, the way that I'm seeing it at this point is that we'll probably have trade accounts done, um, you know, in, within the next like couple of weeks or so. I'm thinking, Although that launched on mainnet. Um, memoless transactions will probably be at the end of Q1, maybe early Q2, and then we'll probably see uh, order books probably end of Q Q2. I'm I'm, th- I'm thinking at this point. Sweet. Yeah, those are all big features. Want to dive into memo lists uh, real quick? Well, you know what was funny? I, I was just talking to Orion before this this space, and we were just chatting about and he, about um, the bull market and how you know, things are just looking really positive for the protocol. And and he was asking me the question about like you know how do things feel differently in this bull market versus the last bull market, right? Because I've been working on this project since the beginning and been around for a while. And it was kind of funny. We were just, I was just kind of commenting in, in, in reflection that, like, the the state of the protocol, the efficiency of it, the structure of it, capabilities of it, is so far away better than it was in the last bull market. It's not even fucking comparable. Like, it's just with streaming swaps, with savers, with like, this is so many things. We, we we've done so much innovation in the last few years. It's almost like 
kind of on it almost makes your head spin in some sense it's all like it just makes me so bullish about this year because we have so many things all coming together at the same time i mean then we didn't even have integrations in, in the in the first bull market <laughs> we didn't i don't even think we had any integrations like you know integration partners other than like thor swap and thor wallet and that kind of thing you know dedicated systems and and like now we have so many that are like positioned it's it's quite uh, it's almost comical how <laughs> How morning, how day and night it is between the between the two of those things. So it's it's really exciting to see that this next bull market is going to be absolutely epic. Yeah, I know anyone here that was around in like April 2021 when Casnet was was first launched. Like, remember the original like original Thor swap interface and actually like making trades on there. Yeah, you, you had to do it through a through a key store wallet. Even like you couldn't just like, you know, user ledger or anything like <laughs> the UX has improved so much and, and the back end too, obviously like the actual protocol itself. It's, it's crazy how, how different it is like today versus yeah. uh, looking back. Yeah. If someone has some old screenshots from like the, the first days, I think I have some somewhere, but I, I can't find them, but I, I, lo I love to you know, look back in like, old screenshots of, uh, of like the way the protocol, like <laughs> the, the front ends like used to look like back in the day. And it's like, it's like, it's like a, it's like a computer terminal, you know, it's, it's yeah. like ancient looking. It was so different. I mean, yeah. to think we didn't, we didn't have almost most of the things we have today that people value, like I know people in our community value, like streaming swaps, like savers, right? Like integrations with trust wallet and, and MetaMask and blah, 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 shapeshift. Like none of those things really existed in the last bull market. Almost none of them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so it's just like the things of most value came from the innovations that we did uh, towards the end of the bull market and, and during the bear market. The things that people are most excited about, people that, that creates the most value for the industry as a whole. So it just, it's kind of, like, I hadn't really thought about it until Orion kind of asked me the question before the spaces, but I was like, oh my God, yeah, my God, we we were so better off than we were before. It's not even, it's not even, yeah. not even funny. And that's because no one really left because the people who, you know, believe in having like this base layer of this, this base layer of decentralized liquidity that is, you know, it's a, its own autonomous system that can just like, that can just operate. They, like the, the people that believe in it, like really believe that, like this is the way that just this is good this is the base layer for liquidity uh in, in all of crypto right and we're already seeing like the first centralized exchanges like you know starting to starting to tap door chain for uh you know just rebalancing liquidity and using that and it, it's just i mean it's obvious to me that's i mean that's why i you know stuck around during the bear and why every every other builder here just believes in it so much because they see that you know things are going to have to move to decentralized rails and that's, that's the only way that makes sense to have like a, a global permissionless decentralized uh system and especially for something that operates with the same ethos as as bitcoin like if you're if you're a bitcoiner why would you want the the future of bitcoin to be controlled by centralized exchanges it's it's, it's crazy yeah, they kind of do. Some of those maxis do. <laughs> it's kind of a it's a cognitive dissonance, but uh, they they do say shit like that, and it's just like, what? Okay, like if, prime example here, like the guy that runs Strike, right? Huge Bitcoiner, like uh, you know, he's like you know all about like decentralization, blah blah. Like you you go to use Strike to to buy Bitcoin, you're buying it from your bank account and you sell it and you, you get fiat to your bank account. It's, it's just, it's just an app to buy and sell Bitcoin using his trusted service. You know, you have to, you're, you're trusting that. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to withdraw from your bank account. Then you're going to get your Bitcoin back, you know? And obviously that's the only way to run some kind of a system that runs on fiat is going to need to have some kind of trusted rails there where you need someone that's, that's a, uh, an intermediary that's going to be taking you know the fiat and then then giving you the bitcoin but like the the entire purpose uh the entire value of bitcoin is being this like decentralized trustless store of value like e -E. so having not having a a trustless base layer of liquidity is like you know the fact that anyone could could be like oh yeah the value of like a uh of a way to exchange it to, to fiat is greater than a value of of the, the value of a way to exchange it permissionlessly is like kind of a crazy thing to say, I think at least. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, I saw, I think his name is Jack Mahler. I want to say his name is the, the CEO. Yeah. Right? yeah Jack Mahler. Yeah. 
I saw him speak at, I think it was the Bitcoin conference. He was, and I'm just, I really don't like that guy. <laughs> I really don't like that guy. I've never seen somebody so cocky over doing so little. <laughs> I'm just, I mean, it's kind of cool. Was, like, I, don't I, get me wrong. I like the app, but just like, just as a, as a principle, you know, like it, the, the fact that you, they, um, that you'd want the base layer of Bitcoin to be like, oh yeah, you can exchange it for for dollars. It's like, all right, like what, what's the what's the value in that? <laughs> yeah, it, it's yeah. I, I have a hard time taking him seriously in general. It just every time he talks, I'm just like, uh, yep, don't care. Just don't care what you're saying. <laughs> for sure, I uh, brought up uh, Compound. What's up? Get some other questions here. Yeah, I just want to jump on here and say, fuck that poly guy and his army of bots. Dude's a scammer. Oh, yeah? Great, thanks. Peter. Hey, guys, what's going on? Just uh, came into your space because of poly and uh, sitting around listening. Um, sounds like you guys are on the ball. Um I want to ask you, just in relation to what you just spoke about, um, how do you feel about the introduction and ramping up of privacy protocols with all this stuff, right? So you don't have to worry about, you know, governments, intermediaries being able to intercept, put holds, freezes on what you're doing and, and not even have eyes on what you're doing. Um, you know, the only way to do that now in a way that you wouldn't be able to be tracked would be with cash. Um, do you guys foresee introducing that into your platform or, or what are some of, if you do have some, do you, what are some of the um, protocols that you like that are the most privacy and security minded where you're not going to have to worry about uh, KYC, AML and other type of issues that uh, can be thorny when it comes to privacy and security? How you want to take this? Want me to take it? You got it. You got it. Okay. Um, for, uh, so uh, I'm a fan of privacy. Like I'm a fan of privacy protocols. Um, we need more of them. We need higher quality ones. Privacy is a very hard thing to accomplish. It's 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 easy to it's easy to do something that kind of works, but it's hard to do something that is really you know um, effective. It's, it's extremely difficult. I think there probably just needs more innovation to be done in the cryptography world. I think they will. Maybe like fully, fully homomorphic uh, encryption will be kind of like the key to really kind of cracking this nut. But well, I don't feel like we're quite there in general, but we're getting there. Um, privacy is a very kind of hot topic in our community. There are people who are you know advocates of adding privacy tokens, privacy chains to the network like Monero, like Zcash. Uh, I'm personally a big fan of it. I, I would love to see that happen uh, at some point in the future. Other people are more kind of um, kind of more hesitant. They don't want to invite uh, um, government oversight or government you know inquiry into Thorchain because you know people are using it to, to launder money through Monero or whatever. Like I think that's one of the concerns that some people some people have. Um, but that's going to be a debate in our community or whether or not we want to add these kind of things. Monero's is very difficult to add. We, we, we spent a lot of time trying to get the, the tech right to add it, and we have it mostly there. We, and we're um, getting closer, but it's just extremely difficult to, to accomplish. Zcash is a lot easier to do in theory uh, than, than Monero, but I would love to see us add some privacy tokens or privacy chains uh, to the network. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Also important to note that you know Thorchain just as a base layer protocol, um, you all, like all, all Thorchain cares about is whether you can send coins to Thorchain and with a memo to swap to anything, right? So you can just like Thor, Thorchain has no concept of anything outside of just what's on chain. So it just it accepts Bitcoin from you know any valid any valid. Uh, any valid sender, right? As long as it has a, as long as it has a memo sent to the right Thorchain vault, it just recognizes that and does the swap. So, like Thorchain as a protocol has no concept of like identity or anything, anything outside of just like uh, just just value. Um, so that's just an, an important point about the the protocol. It doesn't it doesn't know anything outside of what's on chain. So uh, you know, obviously, the, the, as a as an interface, 
like interfaces can do whatever they want and like you know obviously that's something that interfaces um you know might need to might need to do something to protect themselves but like as a protocol like thorchain has no ability to uh, you know censor transactions or to to, to do anything yeah, it, so it sounds like you guys would also be protected like uh analogous to section 230 um allowing the tech companies or the social media companies to have um no liability when it comes to what is being posted on their mediums. So, I mean, from what you explained, it just sounds like you allow interactions um, as long as they're on chain on your protocol and you really have no say whatsoever as far as the content of what is happening or the background of, of the actors that are coming in to use the protocol. Is that correct? Right. I mean, it's like Uniswap. Like anyone could just interact with the contracts. Like the, the front end can do whatever it wants, but the actual back end has no concept of anything beyond just you know the interaction with the protocol itself. So, yep. Thanks, man. Uh, Crypto Sailor. Oh, hello, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me on. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Uh, great job again on the spaces. Appreciate it as always. Um, I actually came up just to do some transparency. Um, I understand, of course, there's always drama in, in discussions that are going on, and there are some of us who like the idea of an organized forum for that in terms of some kind of foundation or something or whatever it ends up being called, and we are doing some exploratory discussions on this. And... Um, if people are interested, they can get in touch with me in participating more. But I just want to make people aware because obviously to do this, I would never uh, want to go in any kind of secretive manner in the going about of it. And just as a little background, I um, have been involved in the crypto industry or community since 2011. I helped organize community events like meetups and conferences. Uh, in the original Bitcoin community, I helped uh, organize and form the Bitcoin Association of Canada. And so I've been very much involved in these kinds of endeavors before. And there, uh, I think, are a lot of benefits. And so I'm just wanting to make sure that everybody is aware of this. And this is 100% a, a, a friendly endeavor uh, looking to support what we see as a lot of tremendous work, a lot of top tier professionalism around development and security and thinking through of the consequences of Thorify and it's my own perspective that out of respect for the tremendous amount of wisdom and knowledge experience that the technical team has, that we should respect that. And as well as the, the people who are contributing the real value to the network, such as providing liquidity and running nodes, uh, that we should, I think, my own opinion, and I think the opinion of those of us discussing this, is that we should elevate that level of professionalism in terms of business and marketing and communications and things like this out of respect for that. So I just am saying that to, to make sure everybody's aware of this and there's no attempt to disrupt existing development processes. Uh, if you look at generally the groups that do this kind of thing, maybe they're involved a little bit more in development, but I think there's a really quality development group. Uh, I myself have mentioned before, I, as someone from the engineering side of things, I don't disagree with 99% of what the development team has done. I think they always do a good job, especially in responding to security issues. So that's kind of why I came up. And I don't mean to you know, disrupt your conversation, but again, out of you know, an abundance of appreciation for uh, the, the team developing and of transparency, I just wanted to let everybody on the call know that. Uh, and I'm not sure if there's any other questions or whatever. I don't mean to disrupt your, your, your call, as I said. So thanks very much. Thanks, Ella. Appreciate the, uh, the, the transparency and the comment. Appreciate that. Cool. I just want to talk about Chad. Anything, anything else or uh, should we wrap it up? Um, well, we got a pretty decent audience still here, 300 people, so people are still interested in chatting. Anybody who wants to come up and ask a question or engage or has a welcome to, um, I'm trying to think of there's anything else we want to talk to that's like more recent. Um, 
Did you want to I talk a bit about there were some recent issues that people I mean there is like an article that was published about some rift in the community and stuff like that. I don't know if you've gone much into that in a public space or I missed it on this call. Uh, just interested in your thoughts or whether or not it's appropriate. Um, I mean, I, I think that like I think that the the conversation is going to require a long term conversation. Right. I, it's not something we're going to settle like today or even this month or whatever. There's just going to be an ongoing conversation in the community about us deciding what, what do we want, what do we want to see for, how we want to move forward. Right. And in the end, we're going to have, you know, step by step processes of talking about ADRs like ADR 012 is one that's going to be voting on. I think uh, tomorrow, I think, I think the voting starts, if I'm not mistaken, um, and, and voting on, on each thing. So I think. It's probably best that we that when we talk about these kind of things, that we, we can have kind of high level conversations if you want to, and that's and that's fine. But it's it's more helpful to to talk about kind of individual kind of proposals. So ADR zero twelve is, is the next one, and then is the one we're going to be voting on. You know, um, I think tomorrow or early next week, and that'll be kind of a, a topic of conversation that we could kind of get into more details about. Yeah, so voting for that is probably going to open up pretty soon. I mean, I guess we could just talk about this for, like, one last thing, just, like, what the ADR is and, uh, like, what it means. So it's basically the ADR to scale the, the lending protocol. So um, as part of the scaling of the lending protocol, like, basically what this is a vote for is, um, is a couple of things. First is to set the maximum collateralization ratio of lending. So, you know, take out, take out a loan against your native Bitcoin. What's your collateralization ratio? Uh it'd be 200% or 50% LTV, which is probably simpler terms for people to think about. And the other thing would be to be the, to burn the standby reserve. So there's a, there's a standby reserve, which has never been deployed and set aside since the beginning of the protocol. And this proposal would set the LTV to 50%, uh, always. So you'd always get a 50% LTV loan as long as, uh, we're not at the lending caps and it would burn the entire standby reserve. And by burning the standby reserve, it opens up space for lending because of the lending lever. And then, so the lending lever is a mechanic that um, basically allows for um, you know, some, some margin of safety. So that way, um, uh, with, with the mechanics of lending, that if the room price decreases even, even a lot um, in comparison to Bitcoin or Ethereum, then there's no mint there's no net mint of, of rune from the maximum supply, uh, even if it decreases a lot. So essentially what this does is it opens up, I think, somewhere around like 15 million, uh, 15 million rune of space in the lending protocol. So that scales uh, up 20. lending, uh, 20 million rune. So that scales it up to, what, like 50, uh, $50 million or something like that into the lending protocol. So it would yeah, essentially it would, allow yeah, lending it. to start really ripping. It'd be 25 million rune for, for open for loans, which means in total, in total, that would be, you know, whatever the price of rune is times that. So it's a lot of money. It's 125 million, 130 million. Uh, that's, that includes the loans that are already currently open, of course. But let me, let me kind of talk about it a, a little bit differently. The, the cow kind of give it good, like, kind of technical explanation, but let's kind of, like, give more context to it. So the lending that we, that we have on ThorChain is very different. It's structurally very different than every other lending, lending protocol that you've ever heard about before. It's very experimental and it's very novel. And it allows us to do things that nobody else can do, right? It allows us to have a better loan um, offer than anybody else can do in, in, in the industry. And the, when we first launched it, we wanted to keep it small. So we only launched it with a 5 million cap, which is like, I think like 1% or something like this, 1% of the, the total supply of room. And so it's, it was launched in a very, very small way, just to make sure there was no bugs, no exploits, you know, keep it small, keep it tight, um, slow launch, you know, ramp it up over time. But that first kind of launch, we wanted to just kind of see what the market behavior was with a small little tiny cap, make sure there's no bugs or problems, whatever. And we've gotten through that. And thus far, we've seen nothing but really, you know, green flags, right? The number of loans that open and closed uh, in the network is very small, much smaller than I would have thought. Right, I think it's like around 700 loans are currently open, and a total of like 50 loans or something like this have been closed. And out of the loans that have been closed, almost every single one of them has been 
it closed when the collateral asset is up in value, which is positive for the protocol. So thus far, it's been really positive, and we've seen a lot of green flags. But it's also very early too, right? You can't look at that and say, "Hey, everything's great," you know, "Yolo, let's go." No, I don't. I, don't th I think that would be um, um, uh, irresponsible. So the next part, at least in my view, is now that we've confirmed that the basically the code works and basically the lending uh, has been very effective, at least in that small amount. I want to see it kind of scale up to about 5x where it is now, which is what we're, we're talking about, and see how the lending happens and with a larger data set of collection of information, right, over a longer period of time, right? We've only been lending for, I think we launched it in August or something like this, so it's been, you know, about six months, a little over six months, and I want to kind of give it more time just so we can collect more data about how users interact with this system, right? Um, what is the behavior that they have in up markets? What is the behavior they have in down markets? What is the behavior of, like in all those cases and scenarios so that we can understand uh, alone with this kind of attributes, alone with this kind of deal, um, how does the real world respond to it? And and part of that, I think, w w which is one of the reasons I wanted to go down to 200% uh, CR or a 50% LTV, which is a much better deal for, for, the, for the borrower, which is great, because we kind of like sat around like 85, 90 percent for like a, for like months. Because as we as you get higher in utilization of the cap, the LTV drops, 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 and it gets less and less enticing, you know, as a, as a borrower. And so we, we kind of like saw this kind of balance be struck around 80 percent, 90 percent. So I want to see if we put it 200 percent and lock it at that. It's a much better deal for the for the for the community for the for the borrower. It's actually a much safer deal for the for the protocol. It's actually safer, less li less likely to have any issues. Um, and the amount of value that we extract from those loans can be the same as, as what it is now if we if the demand is there. If the lower uh, if the higher LTV constitutes more demand, which I think it naturally would, uh, we would see a lot of value come into the protocol, which is really good. So if, uh, what I'm looking to see happen, if this gets passed, if people vote for it and it passes, um, what I'm looking to see happen is I want to see another six months of behavior. I want to see, you know, probably, I'm, I'm guessing 5x or maybe, maybe actually probably more than 5x because we're going to a 50% LTV, so it would allow for more loans to be opened. So probably more than 5x number of loans to be opened and, and, we'll, and we can continue to see the behavior of those people and what they do. And then we'll see how fast the caps get hit. When we lock it at 50% LTV rather than 50% and then it goes down to uh, 20%, how, how fast do people dive on this thing? And, and does it happen in, in you know, a month or three months or six months? Like, what is it? You know, that, um, that's what I'm fascinated to, to, to learn more about. The other thing that I'm curious to do, not today or this week, but relating to s the same area, is actually dropping the LTV, uh, raising the LTV again. Uh, instead of going to 50%, going to 67%. And the reason why I want to do that is because, once again, you create a better deal for, 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 the, for the borrowers. You make it a safer for the protocol. Uh, and you create a loan that I don't think exists within DeFi. Like, I don't think you can get a 67% LTV on any loan within DeFi, at least not that I'm aware. If anybody else knows about one, you know, let me know or whatever. But I'm pretty sure I've never heard of it. And you might see uh, what I'm what I would hope to see is kind of like a vampire attack, right? We saw a good example of a vampire attack was when we saw that when Sushi first launched back in twenty uh, what was that twenty eighteen I think it was I want to say 2017, 2018. And where Sushi launched, and they had this new token called Sushi, and you could mine it through liquidity and mining, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of the capital, a lot of the LTV that was in Uniswap exited. And they almost, like, was, they lost like 80%, something crazy like that, of their LTV. And it all just flooded into Sushi, like literally in like in a week. It was like in a few days even. It was kind of crazy to watch. Now, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen to Thorchain. I'm not trying to make predictions of that or anything like that. I'm just saying that's an example of what a, a vampire attack looks like. So when you have a, a lending system, right, that can offer a much better deal than what any other lending protocol can do, not what they do do today, but what they can do. They can't safely do a 6 7% LTV. It just wouldn't make sense. It's too risky for the borrower to do that. In our case, it's not because our design is so different. 
And so what happens in the, when you have a situation when you have a lending protocol that is remarkably different than everybody else and therefore can provide a better deal than anything else can do, is there going to be a mass exodus from Ave compound, you know, whatever, 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 into the four chain system because it's just better. You six percent LTV, you get zero percent interest locked in at that, and you get um, uh, no liquidations and you get no exp expiration of your loan. I mean, that's pretty fucking awesome. I mean, like you cannot look me with a straight eye and tell me that isn't ridiculously um, amazing. Right, and in the lending market in general is absolutely massive. It's 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 bigger than than the AMM market, in fact. Right, when we have an opportunity to do that in a really big way, and and do it not just for the East people, which is what most of lending is today, the vast majority of it is, but do it for the entire industry, including layer one Bitcoin. I mean, that's fucking. I don't know. That, that, to me, I'm just blown away by that. I think that's just so innovative and so different and such a better value for the industry. That I'm just, it gets me really interested and really excited about it. So I'm, I'm, I want to do this 20%, sorry, 200% uh, CR, a, a, aka 50% LTV. In the meantime, it's kind of a stepping stone. But I'm interested in maybe in another few months, six months, whatever it's going to be, to, to raise that LTV up to 67% and then see how the market reacts. Because I think it might be fairly strong. Yeah, man, great explanation. Um, and... So, so this ADR is just to just to raise the LT or lower, you know, it's to change the LTV to fifty percent essentially. So uh, that's what the vote's on. Great explanation on what the lending protocol is, and uh, it, it seems like the like the devs are um, pretty unanimously in favor. There's definitely some people that are, you know, there's people that are just against the lending protocol in the first place, which is also a fair criticism. But it, uh, I haven't seen any explicit feedback from the node operators saying that they would disagree with this change. So, uh, like right now, it's definitely looking like there's there's interest for this. I know like Pluto has, um, you know, said he's in, in favor. Like I, I would I would be in favor of you know ADR twelve. So not not that I have a vote, but <laughs> you know, I guess the, the, the nodes are the ones that vote on the ADRs. So um, I haven't seen any nodes that have explicitly said that they wouldn't vote for it. But um, only way to find out is by doing the vote. So we'll see what happens uh, next week, probably. Yeah, it's gonna be exciting. That's gonna be really exciting just to watch how that unfurls. It's like it's approved and happens, which hopefully it will. Uh, it's I'm I'm gonna be excited just to watch it. So much data collect. Orion, get your data ready. Do some data analysis. Crunch those numbers. It's gonna all be all the, all the flip side watch. nerds. They're uh, they're ready. Yeah, we need to get, we need to get um, uh, Wiggum. And, and Orion to start pumping out some, you know, and the other guy, what's his name? Um, Dan, not Dan. Uh, Kellen? Uh, okay, there's some guy who has a name, like his name is like twice or three times. Dan, uh, Bam Bam? Yeah, that's it, Bam Bam. Get that guy too, because they, they create, yeah. they do a lot of good work and they produce really good charts and it'll be really fascinating to see how the market reacts to it. Could I make a quick comment? Uh I think it's important in an open source project for dissent to be heard as well. And I understand that people in this space, like yourself, uh, Chad, and the ThorChain account are positive to this. I'd like to hear from the other side who are negative as well. I think that's important to make sure that there's representation of the different perspectives on a forum like this. And the other thing I would say is, Chad, you've mentioned this before, but, uh, you know, burning or whatever this is, it's not reducing supply. It's not the tokenomics you know, degenerative, want to be central banking thing where you're trying to control supply to manipulate economic outcomes, it is being used to underwrite the lending, correct? Um, uh, how would I phrase this? I mean, it's, it's burning the 60 million standby room is, is meant to give space. Right. So it's like, we could, like, let me put it this way. We could just raise the cap, without burning anything and just like have it and just allow people to open loans, you know, somewhat arbitrarily, like there's nothing stopping us from doing that. Right. But because lending is like, because it's design is so new and the idea of it's so novel and, and, and it's, it's, it's assumptions need to be tested in the market. You can't test it, you know, in a, in an Excel sheet, you need the real market. You need the real people. You need real money. Uh, and then, so in order to do that in a way that's as safe as possible for the protocol, we, we try to utilize, you know, um, uh, some room that we've, that we've allocated for some, some purpose and just reallocate for this purpose just to, to, 
to, to give protection to the network so that worst case scenario is, um, you know, lending goes bad for some, whatever the hell the reason is, and 100% of the loans close, which that never actually happens, even when the lending protocol collapses, uh, you know, only half the loans are closed. Like that was pretty much true with Anchor. That's true with like BlockFi when they became insolvent. Like really you only get like the worst case scenario is like half the loans to close. But let's just imagine the worst case scenario and say it's 100%. You want to make sure that like that in our case, it wouldn't actually cause an inflation of the Rune token, right? Rune sold is always going to be 500 million. That's just, that's the hard cap. It's not going to mint 510 million or something like this. It, it's designed to do that. Now, in order to do that, to maintain the 500 million cap and that, you know, everybody, including myself, wants to maintain. Um, you have to get that capital from, from somewhere, you know, in order to, to, to kind of try out this idea, right? And so initially you use the 15 million room that's missing from supply due to people who didn't uh, upgrade their room from BEP2 to room to a to native room. That was like the kind of, we kind of borrowed from that scenario, basically, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a free thing to borrow from. And then, you know, we use that up. We're now at, uh, I think like 80 something, 82%, whatever it is of that cap of that first 15 million. And now we got this 60 million that we're looking to use. And then we're asking the community if it's okay to use the 60 million for this particular purpose, which we're going to be voting on over the course of the next week. Right. And after that point, we can just decide about like how we want, if we want to further scale it, you know, how do we want to do it after that point? And there's a lot of different ways to think about it. We can say, uh, we're going to change the lending lever to be instead of one third of the missing rune, uh, we'll do one half. Right, and that'll create more space. Or we could say, um, all right, we're going to do it differently. Um, we're going to allow be it relative to the pools, right? We're not going to allow loans to be open that are greater than the pool value itself. I don't know. This, you can kind of change the way you think about the caps in that in that sense as well. So it's all it's all very different. But I, I think the one thing I want people to understand is that when we say burning sixty million from the standby reserve. I think people get confused and, and they think that we're going to reduce the supply by 60 million, which is not technically accurate because the room that's in the reserve, standby or active, is not part of circulating supply, right? So the circulating supply of room is going to be stay the same. So while people may, you know, who are confused might buy room to cause the room, the room price to pump in that sense, that's not what this is about. We're not trying to get the room price to pump because we're burning 60 million. That just, that's just misconception from people who, who may be falling into that. We're purely just taking room that's out of supply and we're removing it from the, the total supply. And theoretically, that supply could get minted back just because loan, lending goes terribly, something happens, blah, 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 whatever happens. And, and all that 60 million room that we burnt gets minted back and, you know, and we're back to where we started kind of more or less, right? So I want to be clear about that and I, want to, I don't want to misconstrue things but make sure people understand the implications of it. Does that help, CryptoSailor? Yeah, absolutely. And I, as you say, it is just confusion. And I think one really important thing about ThorChain is to make sure it's distinguished from all the garbage crypto that's out there. I think some of us who are naturally attracted to quality projects and want to see this technology evolve in a positive way uh, don't pay attention to that. So it seems like there's a lot of good stuff going on in crypto, but from the outside looking in, it's mostly uh, quite cringy. I don't know how <laughs> a more <laughs> a different word to use, but so I think that's maybe even just the word burn is a better, if a better term was used, maybe that would help to alleviate confusion. Yeah. Um, that is the actual technically correct term because what's actually going to happen is we're going to make a code change and do a KV store migration, in which case we will take 60 million rune from the standby wallet and then just call the burn module and burn it. But if there's a better term that you think would be more clear or better, then let me know. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it all, guys. Cool. I'd say uh, let's call it here. Thanks for everyone for, for coming out. And uh, yeah, again, we'll be at East Denver if you guys are going to be there. Uh, we'll, we'll meet up on the 2nd of March. We're going to do a happy hour with Coinage and uh, Zach Guzman and, and their team. And uh, yeah, sounds good, guys.
Yep, first person to arrive at the event uh, in East Denver gets to cuddle with a familiar cow. So, see you guys <laughs> Nope. <there. laughs> <laughs> what, cow? You don't want to cuddle? Come on, you're the cuddle cow. Come on. <laughs> I, I don't even have words. <laughs> I'm just volunteering you for a cuddle. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk. All right. <laughs> See you guys. All right, bro. See you guys.